Good morning, everybody. It is uh, Cade and Reagan uh, Archibald here. I know my picture is saying Reagan Archibald. I'm just logged into the wrong account, so uh, b bear with us here. <laughs> it, we, we got identical twins, I guess, with the same name. Perfect. Um, so we're really excited to have you on the show today. Uh, what we're uh, in Reagan's back, he missed us last week. He, he cried uh, a lot of tears when he wasn't able to make it. <laughs> so you guys should all be really excited to, to have him back so you don't have to listen to me ramble. Um, so today what we're going to be touching on is uh, Reagan's actually going to go through a lot of the pieces on, uh, or at least get you excited about the upcoming event in April, um, talking about putting the art back into medicine and and really w what it means to be an artist and an entrepreneur and some of those things. So uh, I'm really excited to sit back and learn uh, some really cool stuff and uh, hopefully you are too. Uh, before we get started, I want to take care of a couple items. Uh, we Last week we launched our stem cell uh, revolution campaign. Um, that is uh, going to be transformational for a lot of practices and getting uh, stem cells implemented into your clinics and and so we take you step by step uh, through how to do that, what the protocols are, the processes. You have a whole portal uh, set up to do that and so it's a it's an awesome system and, and set up there. So uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, shoot me an email at info at gowellness.com and I can give you some more details or at least uh, send you the links to to learn more about it. And um, and then big thing coming up, uh, let's see, what's today? So I'm looking up at my calendar. So we got about uh, three weeks till our next event, two and a half, three weeks till April 1st and 2nd in Salt Lake City. So make sure if you haven't got registered, get registered for that. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing everybody at uh, Salt Lake City. And so uh, if if you don't have the details on that or you need more info, uh, give us an, a shout to info at gowellness.com and, and uh, we'll, we'll get you all registered. So um, without further ado, let's uh, bring in Reagan and get this thing started. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm stoked because uh, our next session is going to be the best session we've ever done. And... I put a lot of time into this. This essentially creating this manual. Um, of course, every year we're revamping and we're improving our systems because we're learning. And so every 90 days, I've got a learning period. I've got a book to produce. I've got um, goals and targets. But this particular manual is um, it's incredible. And I was able to fit this manual in with doing the Report of Findings training. So the Report of Findings training, uh, I was able to start it kind of at the end of last quarter. But um, this quarter has been very, uh, very productive. But I think you guys are going to love this because a lot of this manual was created while I was on a plane to Italy. And then most of the inspiration came when I was coming home from Italy. So um, if you look at this, uh, this is Pablo Picasso. Now, this, this next event is called Leaning on Kanye West to Transform Healthcare in America. And his, his newest album, uh, last year he, he released the, the Life of Pablo. And uh, I thought it was an amazing album. If you don't like it, that's fine. I, I don't mind. I'm, I only use Kanye as a metaphor for somebody who has really, uh, he believes in himself as an artist and he pushes the envelope in so many different aspects of his life on just proving what it means to be an artist. And I think one of the biggest challenges that you and I have is we're not we're not speaking our truth we're not producing our art as well as we could we're we're stuck in fear we get locked down into what society thinks we should do what others uh, think uh, we should do um, the those nice social conditioning that we receive from our parents from our religion whatever it may be so art is something that I look at as like this pure form even science you know what I find with science is it keeps changing all the time and and science there's never any like it's it's the new religion as William William James called it about 50 years ago 
but um, it keeps changing and it's very fascinating. I love digging into the science, but at the same time with healthcare and medicine, if you don't really get the art back into it, you're going to lose your focus, you're going to lose your passion, and the worst thing that's going to happen is your patients are going to suffer. So when we talk about putting the art back into your medicine, Pablo Picasso is a great example of this because um, he went through a series of stages where he actually started to learn new things and he started to copy other artists and his very first commission work was, uh, you know, it's just basically he's doing these copying other famous artists throughout all time and he was a genius at doing that but then he didn't learn how to do his own art until later on in his life so we'll go through that a little bit but I'm going to use um, Pablo Picasso, Michelangelo, um, Leonardo da Vinci, we'll talk about some of their stories a little bit today but then you know for those of you who are like well what are you getting to Reagan well we'll get there because I think art in the medicine is one of the most beautiful pieces that I love I love walking into a room with a patient and I go with my agenda I've got their labs in front of me and I'm ready to sit down and review the labs I talk to the patient about how they're doing and all of a sudden I have this epiphany like wow my whole protocol everything that I just studied on intellectually it made sense to me now that I'm sensing the energy of this person I've got a totally different treatment plan for them and I can't tell you how many thousands of times that's happened in my practice even if I look at their tongue listen to their pulse and it becomes more of an intuitive awareness of what that patient needs to move to the next level well I'll tell you what that is fuel that just keeps me energized because I start realizing there's a lot more to this medicine than what we think we know and uh, of course there's all the cool labs there's a cool science piece of it and that's what we need as a container to work within but then the art is what comes out of that container so biggest way number one if you're going to create a bigger future you gotta believe in yourself and so when you lose sight of your own future your ability to help others see their future suffers because I think the biggest thing in helping a patient see beyond what their health where their health has taken them is for them to have a bigger future that you help craft for them I met with a patient last night and this patient she said to me she said man I am so grateful because when you first sat down with me usually I just see the patients the very first the ROF I do about six a week and then my team handles everything else but um, this particular patient I was able to she asked to meet with me at the end of the program and she just wanted to give me feedback and just say, man, everything A to Z was, everything your team did was right on. Everybody took such good care of me. I felt like I understand what's going on with my body. I felt like everything that you promised at the beginning, we've met those goals and exceeded them. And I just wanted to thank you. And uh, the biggest thing that I learned from her is that she had no clue the things that she'd be working on throughout her program she thought she was completely healthy in those aspects but what happened is we were actually able to shed so much more light on on other areas of her life that she went from being healthy and she was I mean she's like a 26 year old uh, girl woman and um, she went from you know yeah, maybe like 10 pounds overweight lost weight her thyroid's doing better her energy is 10 times better than it's ever been she's exercising she's got muscle mass she's ready to get pregnant now um, so, um, Dr. Jones, I need you in town so you can make sure that happens. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, so, it's really cool just to see the transformation, but what I was understanding as I was talking to her is that there is a real art that happens in this process. It wasn't like, oh, I was so excited that you guys got my TPO levels down from 250 to, to 25. I feel so grateful for that. It was just more like, I really appreciate the energy that went into this program there's so much that I can't even explain to you so uh, I think that's pretty beautiful artists create great futures so I want you all to be artists when it comes to your medicine um, Pablo here's some here's some quotes he said my mother said to me if you're a soldier you will become a general if you are a monk you will become the Pope instead I was a painter and became Picasso so I, I think that's uh, beautiful a lot of you um, if you think about it, you know, we're becoming artists every single day. We're becoming closer and closer to what our authentic self is. 
And I think the beauty of having a, a wellness program, when you have a, a, a longer period of time to actually work with somebody, more of a concierge program, that's where you can actually put your love and your art back into the medicine. You can actually take time to do those little things like writing your patient just a simple thank you note or in a, a letter of encouragement, just telling them, hey, keep going. I know that you know, you're two months through this program, you're not feeling any better, but keep going. Keep going. Most of our patients with your condition, they don't start feeling better until month six, month seven. So keep going. Um, I think that if you're being an artist, you can make more positive change. Um, if you think about a person who has made a lot of change in your life, if you think about the science behind it, it probably doesn't feel very warm, very cozy, but if you think about the art, like my grandmother was a person, um, both of my grandmothers, but primarily my grandmother on my dad's side, um, Verla. Cade knows Verla, obviously, same grandma. Um, we basically look like twins today. We're laughing at each other. Um, but she would always make like this gorgeous lunch. She At Christmas time, she would bring these amazing gifts perfect bows. She thought every single detail through and I really learned to to receive love from my grandma. Um, I think that's a really hard thing for many of us to do is actually to feel love from others and to receive it. It's that yin side of things. We're in a society that is all, you know, we're, we're a very doing society. We like to give, but um, receiving is so difficult. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's a lesson that I, that I learned from her is the more we can receive, the, the, the better we can actually experience, like the better we can feel, the, the more love we can give. Um, so let's talk about this journey of, of, of mine. I mean, you guys know my story. I got to the point where I was, I was treating about 250 patients a day back to back. Uh, or 250 patients a week, excuse me, um, back to back. And as an acupuncturist, this is, you know, it's pretty intense. Um, even as a, a chiropractor, that's, that's a lot of patients. Um, I went from seeing 40 to 250 in just a couple of years. And I got to the point where I'd get home at night and I would want to be with my kids. I was tired. My hands would hurt from all the needling and palpation that I was doing. Um, I would uh, kind of spend my weekends uh, just recovering, or I, I would try and escape by doing a massive miles on the trail run, so um, probably uh, using that as a, a little bit of a drug, which, you know, is fine, it, it worked for the time, but I had the choice, I had two choices to make. You know, I could keep pushing myself, I could keep struggling, I could keep uh, living with this, like, fear of, man, if, if, I, if I don't make this happen, then this business is not going to survive. So essentially I had this organization that would not function without me. And so I had this real deep desire to have um, like a self-managing company, a company that can just run on its own. So how many of you right now have a self-managing company? If you leave, your, your clinic still thrives and you still do well. Um, maybe you guys could put that in there. How many of you would like one? Maybe this is not even a goal of yours, but for mine, I realized I was so busy. I had so many patients who depended on me that I needed to change. I needed to start creating a different structure. And so two choices, I could keep practicing the way that I was and be 80% happy and have a job that always required me being there and probably burn out. Or number two, take on bigger risk and learn how to be an entrepreneur who could build a self-running organization. And so um, that's what I chose about six years ago now, uh, five years ago, 2012, 2011, 2012. I said, well, if the Mayans are right and the world ends at 2012, then so be it. But if not, then I'm creating uh, an incredible new life that is full of so much passion, so much joy. And I want to create a life that's, um, that is a dream life, and that's what I've done. I mean, I went to Italy, uh, as, I, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. I was there, and that's where a lot of this work got created on the plane. And I, uh, being on the plane, I just realized, like, man, I have the coolest life. And then being in Italy, meeting cool people there, having incredible food, um, incredible experiences, I just I'm so blessed, but I had to make that choice. You know, what kind of life do I want? Do I want to be able to put the art back in this, or am I just going to keep working nonstop like a hamster on a wheel? And so when I made that shift, the biggest thing I had to realize is that there's certain qualities that come out of me. I realized, first of all, that I'm not entitled to anything. 
Um, if I'm creating a self-organizing, self-managing company, then at the end of the day, I can't blame other people for their poor performance or great performance. Now, I just need to create a container. I need to be a better leader. So I wasn't guaranteed a, a paycheck. I wasn't guaranteed success. I wasn't guaranteed that I was going to have multiple clinics. I wasn't guaranteed anything. And that's the very first thing I had to realize is that if I'm going to move into a self-managing company, I'm 100% responsible for everything that's going on in this company, everything that's going on in my life. And so that's the first step that you'll have to take. And so there's other mindsets that I had to shift me to get to taking 100% responsibility because when you're blaming other people, when you're looking at your conditions, you're blaming your team members. A lot of people tell me, man, Reagan, how do you attract such amazing team members? Because most of you have visited the clinics, you've done your on-site training, and you see that I've, there's an incredible group of people around. And you guys are, are like, man, these guys are way more talented than Reagan. How did he do it? Well. I, I would tell you, you can do exactly the same. All you have to do is make sure that, that you have first and foremost cleared every single piece of blame out of your body so that you take 100% responsibility for what's going on. And that's a game changer. It's a life changer. It was for me. And I think if you try it, you'll find out the same for you because everyone on this, we're entrepreneurs. And our success is dependent on us and nobody else. There's not some big government bailout money that's going to help us get through this if we fail. If we fail, we fail. We file bankruptcy and we go through a divorce and you know we go through a time of, of trial and, and struggle, but then we come out of it. But if we don't fail, the rewards are incredible because each one of us has the opportunity to create a self-managing company. And so we're going to be focusing a ton on this in your upcoming workshop April 1st and April 2nd. Actually, March 31st, for those of you who want to learn how to do spinal needling and spinal injections, um, a lot of our stem, cell pay, our stem cell clients are wanting to get their medical providers trained on it. So part of the structural lime and acupuncture program I'm, I'm doing on Friday um, that Friday afternoon from 1 to 5, I'm going to be training you on how to palpate, how to find bony landmarks, how to inject into the spine because it's a, it's a huge life changer for people when you can get stem cells into their spine. So for those of you who are interested, um, come join us Friday at 1 o'clock and then Saturday we're going to be at the Impact Hub downtown Salt Lake and that's going to go from 8.30 registration and then we start right at 9 and then we'll go till 5 o'clock and we're going to have two rooms. So one room is going to be where we're actually training on all the business systems. The other room we're going to have the functional medicine boot camp. So it's functional medicine dojo. It's going to be incredible. Um, we've got some great speakers, really cool layout. It's going to be autoimmune based. So you're going to learn all the secrets to tackling autoimmunity. Um, and then April 2nd, we're going to go through the seven projects to lead to a seven figure practice. So. This is for you who are entrepreneurs, business owners. It's also for your team. Um, so we're going to go through all the projects in the manuals. Yes, I added an additional project. I'm sorry, but it's just mindsets. So, um, so make sure you get registered. You get out to that. Um, if you don't get your money's worth in the first hour, then I'll pay for your plane ticket back home. Um, and I'm not joking. All right, mindset number one. So personal mindset, let's check in real quick. True or false, your purpose is to help as many people as possible, get as healthy as possible with natural medicine. Every day you're making advancements in your ability to grow as a practitioner or team member to create health care that will make a bigger impact for everyone. Mindset number two, you're committed to taking 100% responsibility for your own health and well-being. So are you walking the talk? Um, you wake up every day with renewed commitment to experiment on yourself so you can discover where real health can be found. So, yeah, I mean... Um, one thing I respect about many of you on this uh, webinar today is you guys try new things out yourself. I mean, um, Miller, you're, you're doing that all the time. Nam, Marty, I mean, it's awesome. Mindset number three, um, your target is to find and treat the root cause because you realize that treating symptoms will only get you so far. Your examination, testing, lab reviews, and learning are always expanding and you're using the best resources possible to identify and remove causal agents. So. Um, true or false. I think that's that's a key one. Mindset number four, you enter every patient encounter in a heart-centered flow state that allows you to be creative and to deeply connect with those you serve. 
Your work brings you significant enjoyment and you feel refreshed by your ability to provide meaningful care. Uh, mindset number five, you see that having certainty and clear communication create 90% of your results. What you say is powerful and can transform an ordinary treatment into a life-changing experience because of the confidence you inspire your patients with. So how many of you are, you feel that when you inspire somebody, you know, it comes right back to you. You give somebody love, you're getting love. If you're giving someone confidence, you get confidence. So it's kind of funny how that one works. Mindset number six, you see that office systems can lead to better outcomes because they provide a container that allows you to perform your best work in. So systems create a more meaningful patient experience and reduce everyone's workload. So one of the big differences is for you who are owners, um, business owners, and for those of you who are you know, entrepreneurs, which all of us are, you have to realize that you have to give other people control and you put the charge into it. So control is, that means everything that's working in the present moment, you want to make sure those systems are tight and that everything is just boom, boom, boom. It's, it's, you can reproduce it on a regular basis. You have people who can duplicate exactly what you need to duplicate. That's how you can really start to grow. But what your job is, is that duplication cycle, it, because the universe is always changing, always evolving, you're going to be needing to look into the horizon and saying, okay, how can I adapt my business policy and strategy so that we can actually start growing this? And um, as you start doing that, you'll start to see that, wow, now that you've got the predictable systems in place, you want to have 80% of everything in your office needs to be very predictable. And then that 20% is where you start leading the charge into new avenues, new growth patterns, new service centers. And it's, it's pretty incredible. Uh, mindset number seven, you see, you understand that healing is a unique process that every individual must go through in order to grow. You are simply there as a guide who can direct the patient on the correct path for lasting results that move them in a brighter, healthier future. And mindset number eight, you're finding breakthroughs with new t expanding technology that includes new treatment methods, communication tools, office systems, diagnostic testing. You can see that free the freedom that technology can provide you and your patients when it's properly utilized. So. One of the things with technology is it can be a big stumbling block. And so I would encourage you to make sure that you're using technology that actually works. Otherwise, you're going to get burned out. It's very difficult if your technology doesn't work right, very difficult to actually get a result. Um, okay, so let's talk about, about artists. I promise you guys I talk about Michelangelo, uh, Pablo, maybe Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and there are some very cool things, but uh, I think one of the things that I had no clue of until I started researching this more is that artists actually were enterprising. And um, some of the things that artists, you know, I, I like this quote. I'll, I'll share it with you real quick. Um, when this is Oscar Wilde, he said, when bankers die, dine together, they discuss art. When artists dine together, they discuss money. And so artists see that the more money that they can make, the more freedom it gives them to create. Now, I treat a couple of uh, high-profile artists. Um, one of them is constantly getting commissioned to do artwork for Utah, which is really cool. He's got a couple big sculptures that he's done um, downtown. And the nice thing about it is he does the sculptures and he does the commission work for the state because it pays him really well. But his fascination is in this whole other genre of art. Like he loves doing this paper art. And so it's, it's really powerful to see that. But even the famous artists, if you go way back, um, artists realized that the only way that they could create any freedom for themselves is if they actually had art that would sell. So Van Gogh, when he first started his art enterprise, and many of you know Vincent Van Gogh, um, you know we uh, we we seen his picture with his ear cut off and um, his his portraits and his kind of swirly imagery. But Van Gogh, the uh, original way that he started his business is he told his brother, he said, "Hey, here's a blank canvas. I bet I can put paint on that canvas, and we can sell it for more money than we buy the canvas for." So that was the idea that he started, as simple as that, and I think that's beautiful. But um, I think artists uh, can be an inspiration to us too. I mean, if you look at it, artists, they're not entitled to a paycheck. They're not entitled to an easy way out. They um, put themselves up. They expose themselves to massive criticism. They expose themselves to having people you know, not like their work, being offended by it. They have people who will disown them or break up relationships because of their art. But um, the artists, 
the real artists have no choice. They have to keep producing work. It has to come out of them. They can't hold it on onto it any longer. And that and the majority of you, all of you on this this webinar, there's a couple of you I've never met, but um, the ones that you know, I'm close with, you guys have. You're like a walking piece of art. I love it. Um, you guys are able to express yourselves. You guys are able to um, freely talk about everything that's going on. But the biggest thing is you have this this overall purpose to inspire people, and I think that's ultimately that's what artists do. Artists don't need permission. Um, they they just realize I've got to create art, and then at the other side that we don't think about in society is they've got to sell their art. So Michelangelo, if you look at the the sculptors and painters in the Renaissance area, and I was just reading about the Renaissance last night, and one of the things that triggered the Renaissance and people doing the self portraits was mirrors. Like that's it was like 1400 when mirrors were finally created out of glass. They were able to put some type of metallic um, uh, substance behind the glass and then they created a mirror but it really opened up the whole world of art and so Michelangelo was during this time so he um, Michelangelo he got commissioned by one, a famous pope to paint the Sistine Chapel now many of you know Michelangelo actually had just received a commission to basically work on this very elaborate sculpture for a tombstone that's what Michelangelo did he wasn't a painter um, Michelangelo said, man, this is crazy. I don't want to do this. But you just couldn't say no to Pope Julius. He was very passionate, and he would chop your head off. If you said no, it's like, okay, well, you're going to die then. And so Michelangelo had no choice. And so what he did is, I'll show you a quick image of the Sistine Chapel. You guys remember this, um, this image there. Very powerful. But Michelangelo, when he painted the Sistine Chapel, he, he was working night and day and he would be almost in a trance. He got so skinny when he was doing it because he mathematically, he put, he basically he put mathematical equations so that everything was symmetrical and so he grew a grid system on the Sistine Chapel and that's how he started it. He started it very simple with just like using science as a container to do his art in, just like we're doing with medicine. And he started painting on that wall, and by the end, he, he had this masterpiece. But he was not an artist, but he had no choice because he needed a paycheck because the Pope took away his commission for that sculpting project and said, okay, well, it's up to you. Do you want to survive or, or do you want to paint? Do you want to you do your art and, or, or do you want to die, essentially? And so um, that's how he got his – that's how we got the Sistine Chapel, which is arguably one of the most beautiful works of art in the world. So – um, it's crazy, but he, you know, he had to prove himself, obviously, that he was a good artist. So many of you, I use that as an analogy. Many of you are great acupuncturists, great chiropractors, or some of you are great at functional medicine. But, um, but maybe there's something else. Maybe there is another piece of art that you're not so good at. Um, you know, I, I was not good at functional medicine when I first started. But the more I learned, the more I dug in, the more I was like, oh, now labs make perfect sense to me. I can understand what's going on from a systematic way. I'm still learning. Um, but but at the same time, many of you, I would encourage you to start looking at this as an art. Look at yourself as Michelangelo. Yeah, you're a great nutritionist, Miller, but um, maybe there's some other areas that you can grow into. Maybe you could learn how to be uh, you know, a better teacher. Or maybe we could learn how to be uh, stem cell experts. Um, maybe we can put in regenerative medicine. I mean, there's so many cool things that you can do with this. Pablo Picasso. What, what happened to Pablo is he's a very good artist, uh, gifted at a young age, and he was able to meet one of the uh, highest selling art people in Paris. And so this was in 1900. Um, and so he moved to Paris and started painting canvases. And when he got there, the uh, with Pablo, what happened is he started creating uh, all this art, but it was all based around other people's works of art. And so Pablo Picasso would just copy. He would just copy, 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 and he worked worked night and day at two to three two to three days to fill up this uh, entire room of arts for this uh, event that was coming up that this art broker put out on for him. And he he got all the paintings done. In fact. A lot of paintings were still tacky when people were going through this this art show. Um, a lot of Pablo's uh, paintings were still tacky. I believe this is 1905. And then after that, after he sold, he made 
enough money so he could actually start producing his own art. And then after that, that's when they say Pablo Picasso became an artist. And that's where he just became Picasso. That was it. And uh, he was able to actually produce his art. But the first thing he had to do is copy masters. And I think a lot of us, we've copied our masters. And uh, as I talk about my one of my masters, who I, I copied everything from that I could for a decade, um, and then I, she wanted me to steal her information from her. So I'm going to talk about the difference between copying and stealing. But before we do that, I mean, one of the ways that these people succeeded, I mean, Pablo Picasso, he had to sell those paintings, but people just wanted to see impressions. They want to see impersonations of the classic works of art. And so Pablo Picasso would do like perfect copying, but he'd put one little nuance in there that people would go, wow, that looks really crazy. You know, I'd have like, you know, a dancer with just a little different twist in her hips. Or, you know, he would put little uh, little secret images in there. So, um, pretty cool stuff. But artists, they don't fail. And one thing Andy Warhol, for those of you who have, have heard of them, is um, he says, profit buys freedom, freedom buys time, and the most valuable re and is the most valuable resource for the artist so that more can be created. Good business is the best art. And I think that's that's pretty cool because um, you can find your art in everything that you're doing, but if you don't have a good business process around it, you're going to fail. Um, artists who don't fail, they, they keep going. They realize that um, I've got to create something, I've got to speak my truth, I've got to get it out there, I've got people who need my help, and so um, now I need a business around that so I can actually attract more people, I can keep them as patients, I can inspire them so they refer others to us, um, all those things. So here's a question for you. What are the new treatments or tests that you're experimenting with in your clinic? What obstacles do you anticipate? How can you put the art back into those treatments and tests? All right, so let's talk about stealing like an artist. This is kind of interesting because um, Pablo Picasso, he said, good artists copy, great artists steal. And he of all people in history would know because that's how he that's how he launched his career is just by copying other artists. Now he was able to copy other artists and short he's short floated. I mean he was doing three, four canvases a day before this art show and in that process he just became very methodical, um, very thoughtful in exactly what they were doing. I mean he could paint, I don't know much about art, but the Impressionist era, the post-Impressionist era, he would go to Spanish paintings, he would jump over to more modernist paintings. I mean, he was doing every genre of art and he could copy it perfectly. But he didn't learn how to become Picasso until after he did that process. So uh, my early mentor, Dr. Maikawa, she used to tell us still everything. When we, when we walk into a room, she had one policy and that was when you come into the room with me, don't move the air, don't even breathe. When you're in the room, you're observing. When you, if you move the air, you'll be kicked out. And that was no joke. She said that to so many of us. You want to get kicked out, you move the air. And so it's like, all right, no problem. But then she wanted us to watch every little thing she did. And what I saw is she was actually discovering the successful actions that she was, she was doing as she was treating her patients. And so it was really a very powerful learning experience for me because I was able to get her 30 years of knowledge and I was able to, to steal all that knowledge and download it in myself before I even started practicing. And so um, I thought it was a brilliant start. I grew up on a farm in Idaho and what you'll find is if you don't listen to your mentors and if you're not stealing all the information and value and what they're doing, then um, you'll get your hand chopped off. I mean, you could put your hand in a combine or in many cases when we're plowing the field and you pull the shear pin in the wrong way, you pull the bottom one before the top one, then that whole thing's coming down on top of you and you die. I mean, so, you know, luckily I was trained at an early age to really listen to my mentors and to learn the, the, the real essence of what they're trying to teach me. Because I'm also ADD, I love uh, learning lots of things at a, at a time, but I've been able to learn how to extract the most value out of that learning experience so that I can go and put it into my day-to-day day -day life. Um, Steve Jobs, he said, um, we've always been shameless about stealing great ideas. Um, one of the main things that Steve Jobs stole from college, and hopefully you, most of you have mentors that you, you've stolen their information, I mean, and I'm not talking about stealing and like 
um, uh, a negative way. I'm talking about it as making it your own because I guess we should define what the um, what the definition of stealing is. And I, I have it in here, um, but I'm just going to summarize it. Stealing is when you make something your own. Um, yes, here here's something. Uh, you own it. Okay, if you come down here where my cursor is, um, stealing it. The stealing process means that you take full ownership over everything you've learned. When you steal something, you possess it and it belongs to you. You own it. I get asked often if I'm afraid that my competition will find out all my trade secrets and put me out of business and I always laugh because no one can compete with me. It's impossible. What I create is mine. What you steal from me, it becomes yours, but I, was, I will always be creating new things. So my masterpiece is today, but tomorrow I, cre I will create an entirely new one and many of you have seen that if you've been with me over a year you've seen that yes I'm always creating new things um, that's why I invite you guys to come shadow in my offices so that you can learn as much as you possibly can and I don't try to force how that learning experience goes I ask you what do you need from me how can I mentor you and we'll sit down we'll have conversations but I don't want to put a rigid structure around um, your observation when you come into the clinic because that's you, that's your job, you have to steal it. And yes, you can go steal from any one of the people's jobs, uh, all the moving parts, you go steal from that. I think it's beautiful. Um, I think that's the best way to learn. You know, Pablo, age of 19, that's when he left Spain. So it was Mr. Vollard who gave him the chance. So by June of 1901 is when Pablo had completed all of his impersonations of these great artists for show. So one of the things that Pablo did is he created a new genre of healthcare, and I want to share of of medicine, and I think it's time for us to create a new genre of healthcare. And we're doing that. I mean, our wellness programs. The creative thing about those is when a person comes through the process, like that patient I talked to yesterday, she was just like intrigued by the process that we took her through. That was the biggest thing. So here's just to give you a metaphor of what Picasso would go through when he was painting. So this is the final product of a rendering. Here are the sketches right here. Pretty cool, right? So he would sketch things. Here's where he took a full, you know, a bowl that he drew, and he's just started out with simple lines. Just start out with the most simple, simple, simple. The reason that we can't grow in our business is it gets too complex. I think the reason why most of you are stuck, and when you get stuck, it's because you're looking at things with far too much complexity. So do what, do what Pablo did and just start by doing a little sketch. So one of his most famous pieces of works is right here and all it is is a simple line. He just drew a line and it's obviously a penguin. Um, this is what his final result looked like. I mean it's very beautiful stuff. So very simple artist. Um, Pablo Picasso said art is the elimination of the unnecessary. And we'll be training a little more in detail on this, but just to give you guys an idea, um, Pablo said, learn the rules like a pro so that you can break them like an artist. Um, many of you need to dig in, learn all the basic rules, all the, all the facts, but then at the same time, then you start to see, man, a lot of what my teacher taught me, it only worked for the first couple years of my practice, but once I got to a certain level, I needed another mentor. Now, once I got to that level, then I needed another mentor, and so it's always this evolution and so in order for you to really glean the most out of your learning experience um, with me is you know figure out what is the essence what has what what are we trying to teach what are we trying to get out when you come into my clinic pull that essence out when we're in the class when we're doing the the lecture ask more questions I mean you guys the interaction is so powerful because that's how we all learn together because I learn from you just as much if not more than you learned from me. Um, we need to have our systems dialed in. Uh, when you're creating a new genre of healthcare, Shakespeare, many of you have heard of Shakespeare, I hope, <laughs> um, but Shakespeare, what he did in order for him to produce all these, these cool plays and these beautiful sonnets is he would have, everything would be divided into uh, different syllables. So he had each sonnet, so his sonnets had I think 14 lines and then, no, he had sonnet lines consist of 10 syllables that were divided into five pairs and then he'd have 14 lines in a sonnet with the 12, first 12 lines divided into three, three 
corn trains with four lines each. So he had a structure, and that's all that Shakespeare did. And he produced a lot of material in, in just, you know, I think he lived to be about 35, maybe 38. But the, ra the reason he was able to produce such powerful work is he had a container for it. He had systems. And so when we create systems in our office, um, this is going to be really, really key because, you know, I look at acupuncture treatments. Okay, it's a seven-minute process. How can you make it a seven-minute process? Chiropractic adjustment, how can you make it a five-minute process? A functional medicine visit, how can you make it 25 to 30 minutes? A report of findings, how can you do it in 45 to 60 minutes? Because I've tried, I've experimented. I've spent lots of time in acupuncture. I've spent little time. Some patients need more time occasionally, and so you set up a different visit for that. But that's a different type of visit. But the biggest thing I see in your growth is you cannot differentiate your time. You don't differentiate your visits. So you got acupuncture, and then you're applying functional medicine on it, and then you're doing an ROF over here, and you're, you're just so busy all over the place that you don't have rhythm in your day. And so I think we could all learn from Shakespeare and get some rhythm back in our day. Just get those boom, boom, boom. I'm doing acupuncture now from 9 to 12. And I'm going to be doing seven, and I'm going to be doing eight treatments every single hour. So I've got three hours. I can do, I can do 24 treatments. Um, let's get going. Let's just move it. Boom, 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 boom. And so you get the majority of your acupuncture done in just a few hours. And then you've got time to do marketing. You've got time to do ROFs. You've got time to do your, your functional medicine visits. But until you can learn how to consolidate those visits and actually really fast flow things, then you're going to be stuck with that same canvas. You won't be able to paint anything new because the results you're getting today is exactly the way you've set things up for. Like you're not going to get a different result because you haven't set up your schedule in a different way. Um, so connecting with somebody it does just takes seconds. So what you want to do is, you know, get the energy, the presence, the intention, and learn how to get in that room and and get exactly what you need out of that experience. And learn when you have patients who hold you hostage, who take more of your time. Learn how you can actually get through that. Um, it's incredible. Uh, because that's one of the things I found when I transitioned to a practice that was built solely around me. 250 patient visits. We're fastly becoming one of the largest acupuncture clinics in the country. And then I went and met with uh, Bob Doan, who always brags that he's got the biggest clinic in in the world, in the country, maybe the world. I'm like, oh, don't don't uh, compete with China, but. Um, then I saw how much he was working and sweating, and it was such a busy place that I was like, this is great, but you know, I, I didn't sense like that zen. I didn't sense the flow, and I wanted to create something different. And so that's where we started adding in other service centers. And so you can grow in two ways. You can add more patients, or you can add more service centers. And so I chose both, but now we've got um, very busy clinics. Um, I can go on vacation and still... Um, Clint does great in a lot of cases they do better without me so a couple mindsets that I want to leave you with today but before I move on do you guys have any questions comments anything you'd like to add to the conversation um, I'd love that um, so you know please send those in but um, eight mindsets are you going to be a pro or an amateur artist because amateurs they can create art they can't sell it they're, they're great artists but they never sell it to the point where people see the value in it People love art, but until they see the value in it, they're not going to throw down for it. So um, here's the mindsets. Number one, amateur, putting the art back in your medicine. You plan on working hard day in and day out until you're 100% confident in any new system, treatment protocol, or concept. You want to guarantee in everything you do before jumping into any uncharted waters. So um, is that you? You, know, you just want 100% guaranteed result. You're not going to do anything out of your comfort zone until you're guaranteed you're going to make money, you're guaranteed a profit, et cetera. Pro, you see that every aspect of your practice is growing because you love the creativity that you can now put into your treatment programs. You're expanding your ability to help more people because you've taken the time to experiment with your marketing messages, your sales in the ROF, and your delivery. Hopefully that's you. But So score yourself on an amateur 1 to 10 and a pro 1 to 10. Um, building teams, and I think the key for that is you know you can actually get creative once you've blocked out time for yourself. You've got yourself rejuvenated. You're feeling good. 
you've got a little more sanity in your offices, it's huge. Okay, number two, building 10 times team for future growth and prosperity. And by the way, Sunday, bring your team members all day Saturday, all day Sunday. We're going we're gonna to help you build just phenomenal teams. That's what I feel like the biggest job that, that mine is for you. I, I do a lot of work on your mindset and help you think like an entrepreneur. And I really appreciate that opportunity that you, you guys have given me. But um, if there is one other gift that I could give you that probably would be better, I mean, although it, it can't be independent of this one, it would be helping you build powerful teams, um, people who are empowered because we want to make an impact in healthcare. And a lot of you don't see that you're the biggest impediment to that. You're, it's you that's blocking that flow. Um, all right, so an amateur. You see that teamwork can be very expensive and a major distraction to your growth. You've always worked very efficiently alone and don't depend on teamwork with your coaches, vendors, mentors, or employees or partners. People come and go, so why put in the effort? And so amateurs, some of you are amateurs in using our coaching. That's okay, but I want you to go pro this year. Pro, you see that without a correct fit team in place, you cannot grow and touch more lives. You realize that using Colby Profile keeps everyone's strengths stress down and morale high because you now work in an environment where everyone can thrive. Your entire team expresses appreciation to each other and everyone shows up on time for weekly training meetings ready to excel. You're building lasting relationships with everyone you work with and no longer are a group of employees with an owner but a team with a coach and a leader. All right, one to ten. Ideal hiring. So this, I'm going to go through two more mindsets and then I'm going to we're going to keep you guys on with bated breath for the next webinar, but I want to encourage each one of you to bring your team. And if they can't come, then um, bring them to the next one. If they can't come to that, fire them. Get rid of them. They need to be here. Um, number three, hiring, ideal hiring for massive growth and, and enjoyment. Amateur, you see hiring as a guessing game and hope to find people who are already are talented enough to work with you. You don't have the time to find the right people and aren't interested in training people who will never be able to do what you do anyways. You've, if you do find the right person, they will likely leave, so why put a lot of energy into them? Now, one of the key things that uh, I've learned is recently, if you put mindsets, the eight mindsets that you're looking for, if you've written out your eight mindsets for team members, man, and you put a job posting out there, we just did that recently, and I'm getting the best candidates. They just said, I'm not even looking for a job, but I just, that mindset thing, you know, caught my eye. I'm always just kind of glancing over the, um, you know, job just in case something stands out and the mindset stood out. So um, if you guys want more insights on that, just email me. Um, pro, you have a hiring system that allows you to track, screen, and interview new recruits who share the same mindsets. You have a training and orientation process in place that quickly builds up new capabilities and confidence. Your culture is built around having a scoring system that allows each team member to have clear expectations. You see that everything that was accomplished in the past has nothing to do with growth in the future and you, you hire only indispensable people who have very unique talents that they bring to the table. All right, the final mindset, start and finish. Amateur, you're afraid to transition into any into a new way of performing your services because they require so much time and effort on your part. You are limited in your ability to get things done because your productivity will drop and when you've tried implementing new service, services, things never get completed and it ends up being a waste of time. So this is the amateur who does not know how to delegate, does not know how to hand things off. I like hand off versus delegate. You get your 80% done and give it to somebody else. Um, so powerful pro. You see that the artists and entrepreneurs destroy what needs to be removed to create new growth. You start with removing what's unnecessary and finish with everything it is. So that unnecessary is part of you not staying within your unique talents, your 80%. You work within your, oh, excuse me, you work within your unique talent, talent set and let everyone else work within theirs so that projects are completed ahead of schedule. You see that being a perfectionist is how you avoid completing anything. So yes, a pro is someone who understands their psychology. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest gifts you can give yourself. So for those of you who have not taken the Colby, take it today because we're going to need it this weekend or in two weekends or whenever it is, three weekends. But um, And then also the other thing that I'm going to encourage a lot of you to take is what's called the Strengths Finder. 
And the Strengths Finder, um, I've got it in your projects, but the Strengths Finder is five basic strengths. The Gallup put this together, a bunch of research on the five different strengths, and I, I can't remember exactly where it's at in the manual, but um, it's on the building teams. Um, we're still in talk objections. We're going to go through a lot of talk trainings, teach you how to speak, core values, team members. Um, so you guys have a lot of cool training, front stage process, backstage processes, contracts, bonuses, um, expectations. These are going to be in your new manual, so um, you guys will get some ideas from us, self-organizing, self-scoring, self-managing, and um, checklists. All right, so I don't know where it's at, but um, here's, we're going to have checklists. So anyway, I hope this has been uh, super fun for you. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Love you guys. Can't wait to see you at the next event. And uh, for those of you who want to do the stem cell training course, it's going to be open f until April 1st, I believe. Um, get to the March 31st training for that. If you're doing any spinal injections, you'll want to be at that, that day. Um, and we'll be doing some, some clinical training on getting it launched. Um, but yeah, bring your game face, bring your party face, um, and I'll see you guys next Wednesday. Also, think of two people today that you could uh, talk to about Go Wellness and someone who wants to really expand their practice, who has the same mindset as you. It's got to be somebody who we, we'd want to hang out with and somebody who's really going to make a difference. So, And then send them our way. Um, let's get them started. So thanks, you guys. Love you. Thanks, everybody.